My name's Josh. I'm a co-host on The Imperfects, the son of Sri Lankan and English immigrants, and I call Australia home. I'd like to recognise the traditional peoples of this continent whose land was stolen nearly 250 years ago. In particular, we at The Imperfects would like to acknowledge the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation as the traditional owners of the land on which this podcast was recorded, and we extend our respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. I'm inspired by the strength and endurance of the world's oldest living culture, and we at The Imperfects pay homage to the traditions of story when we share stories on our podcast. The Imperfects is not a licensed mental health service and is not a substitute for professional mental health advice, treatment or assessment. The advice given in this episode is general in nature, but if you're struggling, please see a healthcare professional or call Lifeline on 131114. Quick, is anyone here a doctor? Yes, her name is Dr. Emily, and she's a psychologist. Please welcome to The Imperfects, our very own psychologist! Bit of a pump up, isn't it? Mm-hmm. Oh, they had a wig on for a second. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it is quite... Sorry. It is... I just, I just wow. adjusted. <laughs> Just turned, just. I've just turned to my right and looked at Hugh's hair. It's really, you've really done it up in a way that. He- I've never seen it look like that. Before. I don't know what you're laughing at. I can't see it. So, But just as we started, I realized I put the microphone, not the microphone on my head, the headphones on my head, and I'd really slick my hair back. Yeah. Which is never flattering for me, so I thought I'll just like drag it forward a bit. I don't yeah. know what I've done. It's- it just looks very different than normal. It just oh, gave me a shock. I won't see this until we post it on social it media. It looks like you got curls. Oh, really? Yeah. It kind of looks like a. I thought you were like pranking us. Like you. Like- <laughs> <laughs> anyway, hello, Em. Hello. Good to have you back. It's great to be here. Now, Doctor M, as as people may know, you come in every month and you grace us with your brain and your knowledge <laughs> and yourself and. Uh, Often you, well, always you kind of look back to the archives of our episodes and you'll find an episode that you think you could maybe expand a little bit on from a, from a psychologist's point of view. Today, which, is there an episode you mm-hmm. want to talk about? Right. Yeah, there's actually part of Esther Perel's Ooh, um, yeah. academy, but specifically Josh talking about your experience of anger. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I thought that... It was actually really interesting because I feel as though talking about anger is a really important thing. But when I went back through all the episodes, really we don't talk about it very often. And mm-hmm. I think yeah. that in of itself is really interesting. Um, mm, yeah. I, yeah, I'll be really interested in this because I, I'm not sure if my experience is – I feel quite alone in my – because I haven't really talked about, about anyone and shameful about it that I have these moments. So, yeah, fascinating. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I feel like it pops up a lot for parents with young kids, people feeling anger and when they feel like they wouldn't describe themselves as an angry person. We The other day I was driving Benji and Elsie somewhere and someone did some terrible driving in front of me and I just couldn't get past them and I did like a really quick beep and I it was such a quick beep and Benji said, why did you beep the horn like that? And I said, well, I just wanted to let them know that they're in the way but I'm not an angry person so I didn't want to – and he said, you get angry at me and Elsie all the time. <laughs> and I went, oh, gosh. Mm. And I don't think I get angry at them all the time, but he was very quick to point out that I get angry. And I do not see myself as an angry person, mm. far from it. And it made me feel really sad that mm. the people I care about most in the world would describe me as being angry. Mm. Well, I don't know if he'd describe me as angry, but anger, when I said I'm not an angry person, he disagreed straight away. Mm. And I thought, gosh, no one else in the world would describe me as that. Mm. So I think... Yes, sorry. I've just I've already made this about me and my kids, but suffice mm. to say, I think this would be a very relatable topic. Yeah. Mm. So I was just you know thinking about how best to talk about this, and I wanted to I guess make a little disclaimer at the beginning that I won't be talking about anger and the expression of anger within the context of domestic violence. Mm-hmm. You know, just being really transparent, that's not my area of competence, yep. and I don't want to um, you know suggest that it is by talking about that. So that might be another area that you can you know talk about in another episode with somebody else yeah. as well. I think it was last year we had Tarang Chola on the show and he talked at length about domestic violence and particularly around men and, and men's violence. So we'll, we'll link to that episode if, if you did want to hear more about that. He's a, a beautiful episode and you can there's so much wonderful stuff of him out there. So mm. not just on our podcast, he's got his own incredible podcast yes, where the, the whole thing's about domestic violence and it's 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 um he's extraordinary. Mm. Yeah. Okay, so mm. for the anger that you're going to talk about, you've got a have you got a clip to play I do. from? Yeah, great. From the Esther episode. Uh, yeah, I had 
it's funny you should bring up that the, the power thing because I I've been pro, prone to sort of low moods throughout my life and I never realize uh, it was recently I got angry about something at home I can't remember what it was it was with you know four month old child lack of sleep emotions are quick to <laughs> come to the surface and my wife said to me something like I really uh, even though I don't direct anger at her I kind of I'm a good one to go out and hit an inanimate object in the backyard or something like that. And she said, I really hate it when you get in these moods. It really, I, I hate it. And it was, I don't know what, it, what, where, what I was thinking, but up until that point, I never really considered that my moods could affect other people. <laughs> I was like, this is, this is my stuff. <laughs> like, how, yes. what? Yeah. And I hadn't really, it was a revelation for me that I had that. And it's exactly what you're saying. It was power. I had, I thought, here am I sulking and being angry in the corner. Right. I'm I'm the small person in the room at the moment and everyone else is going on and doing their thing and is flourishing and thriving. Right. Um, but I had no idea that I had an effect on everyone yes, else. Yes, and that it's space. scary and that she wouldn't want your little one to actually experience that kind of energy because mm. while she has somewhat learned to know that you're going to go hit the stuff and come back, mm. a little one who experienced that kind of energy, it can be very frightening. Wow, that was a that was a that was a good moment. Mm. Mm. I really commend you on sharing that, actually, Josh. Oh, yeah, uh, yeah. I still feel a bit of shame because it's it's a it's a very present thing. I also wanted to clarify I, with what you said before about domestic violence. I, I um I guess there was a worry that in me admitting that that people would think I because I he you know me well, you all know me, but he you know me forever. I don't think I've ever shown anger towards anyone else except myself. I'm very good at doing it to myself, but mm, I wanted to you be... You did throw a tennis ball at me once. <laughs> so oh, we'll never hear the end of that. Liar. <laughs> so I don't, yeah. <laughs> but I, I just hope it's not implied that... I, I just hope I didn't misrepresent myself mm. and people think yeah. that I'm an angry person towards other people. That's mm. what I don't think clarifying, I clarifying, yeah. yeah. Mm. Anyway, yeah, so it's, it's still... And I last... Oh, well... No, no children around, but last night I, at 3 a.m., I needed to get the Panadol for our youngest because he's teething and needed Panadol to get back to sleep. I grabbed it and I was filling up the syringe thing that you put it in and I dropped the bottle and it spilled everywhere and I didn't have any. And I, um, this feels really embarrassing to say this because I feel like such an idiot, but I headbutted the door as hard as I could oh. to... Oh in anger at myself for being such an effing idiot. And I just, I wanted to inflict physical pain on myself mm -hmm. to match the anger I had for doing what I just did, which is such a, I mean, it, it wasn't even an issue because I'd the, it wasn't like it was going to cause any problem because I already had the amount I needed in the syringe. He was still going to get his medicine, but I'd dropped the bottle, which means we couldn't get him any more throughout the night if he needed. Mm. What you just said is really important and, and again, Really courageous, I think, to share that. I think it's really beneficial for other people to be able to hear that this is actually a really natural response in some ways. Mm. Um, and, you know, I'd really like to get to at some point kind of looking at understanding or all of us understanding what our, what the antecedents are to the experience of anger and then what the consequences are after expressing them. Mm. But I thought maybe before we get there, it might be useful to kind of really define what it is that I'm talking about today and how I understand and work with anger, I suppose. Antecedents, what a beautiful word. Yep. So, Sorry. yes, we'll, we will definitely get to that. Um, <laughs> so I tend to work from an acceptance and commitment therapy approach, and there is a very highly regarded therapist called Robin Wassler in the States, and she defines anger in terms of having four general components. Um, and the breakdown of this, is, I feel, is very important to understanding our whole experience. So the first is, you know, very obviously a really intense displeasure, feeling of displeasure. The second is, a, is your physiological response, so your sensations in the body. The third are the thoughts, so thoughts related to the particular experience. And the last one is your action. So I might go through some of those, mm. but I think what feels really necessary to, and in fact, kind of crucial to distinguish is the difference between the feelings of anger and the actions or behavior of anger. Does that make sense? The yep. feelings versus the actions and behavior. Yep. Yeah. 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 
Because why, why is being angry angry a problem? Like as in yeah. what's the – like obviously that's a problem. Is, is it a problem? Is yeah, I mean, I guess it is if, if it's affecting the people around you. Absolutely. If you're getting angry, it mm-hmm. makes you – it's a disconnecting and a bit scary for people, even if it's like they don't feel threatened. I'm sure in the example that Josh just shared, it's probably quite scary for – so if what, worrying that he's going to hurt himself or whatever it is or uh, yeah, it's an unpleasant course. experience. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. One of the things that feels really important to me is is kind of exploring the fact that there is this taboo around feeling anger. And that in many ways that there's this shame attached to having anger. And that comes from early childhood experiences and what we hear and what we witness about about anger in our family. So Mm. there will be both implicit rules and explicit rules about the expression of anger within your family. Mm -hmm. And so two examples of this, and I think this actually kind of sums up why I feel like it's important is that there are two poles of anger. At one end of the continuum, we've got reactivity. And that's really kind of what we don't like. We don't like seeing the reactivity. But on the other end of the spectrum of that continuum is suppression. But that does not mean that that person who's suppression that, suppressing that emotion is not feeling it mm. or is not experiencing anger because anger is a natural, necessary human response to something difficult. Mm-hmm. Both poles result in some, you know, really difficult outcomes for us. But we so often forget the suppression part of the spectrum, which is also really important. Mm-hmm. And so it was really interesting actually, as you were saying, Hugh, that I'm not an angry person. You know, to me, that was actually something I was thinking about beforehand, about how we don't like to identify with feeling anger. Yeah. Um, no one would like describing themselves as that, yeah. Uh-huh. But in actual fact, it's it's a normal and natural mm. response. And in fact, it's a healthy response. So we're all angry people. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, in the same way in the same way that we can all be happy and sad yeah, okay. and mm. it is but there's like a taboo around that feeling. It's a bad or shameful yeah, feeling okay. to have. Yeah. Yeah. And is that because it's like it, it's scary? Because like I, like you tell when you told that story, Josh, about you headbutting the door, mm. like that, I, I was like, oh god, that's. I feel like I would be really scared if I saw that, even though I know you. Mm. Like it's sort of like there's something like it's like out of control. Yeah, or we, something. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. And I, uh, yeah, um, I am ashamed of doing it, but because I know that feeling of when you're around someone, even if the anger's not directed at you at all, when you see someone lose it and you're in their presence, it's terrifying. But I think it's just, uh, but you, you, as you're saying it, I was like, I, I, f- I felt myself being like, oh my God, this is, but then at, well, after you said it, I was like, that is an amazing thing to share. Yes. Mm. Like. Incredible. It, like, I don't, I just don't think, the more I think about it, I think, it, like, I mean, you already said it, Em, but I just think it is really worth, like, it's just a very brave thing to share and not to over dramatize it mm. unnecessarily. But because of my initial reaction, which was like, oh, that's a scary thing. I don't know if I would admit to doing yeah. that. But I wish I was able, now having heard you do it, I wish I was able to admit to doing that. <laughs> no, Mara, it was too big a deal. No, I don't, think it, no I don't think it is. <laughs> I think it's probably um, extra, M would know better than us. It illustrates the point perfectly that yeah, anger is not something we want to admit to. Mm. or And just because it's not in my life, it's probably extremely common. Mm. Makes it even more important to talk about it. So. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's even interesting that you just say that it's not in my life, but it it will be in your life, but in a way that you maybe don't notice. Ah, uh, interesting. Okay. Because when I say that, I mean like I, I don't, but I do get angry actually. Mm-hmm. I just never had butted a door yet. Yeah. And <laughs> I think that's, the right door. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's to where we're differentiating what is the action and what is the feeling. Mm. So, um, you know, we've got aggression and hostility at one end and that's the action. And then again, suppression at the other, that's yeah. the action. I'm um, suppression. Yeah. Um, and they're both unhealthy. Is that kind of the When point? they're happening all the time, yeah. then yes. And of course, mm. like I think we all have circumstances where, you know, maybe we, like basically we're talking about overreaction and underreaction. Mm. Okay. If that's an, kind of an easier yeah. way to kind mm. of to, to see it. Mm. And of course there are times when we overreact. And, you know, if they happen every now and then, like that's not necessarily going to have a really big cost or impact upon, you know, your sense of quality in your life. 
Mm. But if it's like habitual and it's happening all the time, then that's of course something to have a look at. Mm. Yeah, that's yeah. I mean, like now that I think it through, and you say that, like I'm very much on the suppression end of the mm-hmm. spectrum. But it instead of it, um, I guess the, the only way instead of like a tap bursting, it just like seeps out for hours. The water, so it's like it's still leaking, and it's still affecting. It's still causing damage. The water, but it's just like very small amounts at a time and maybe seeps out for hours mm. as opposed to like it bursting and going like, oh, it's all out. I cannot for the life of me picture you being angry. No, me neither. Like not even, I don't, I could picture you playing an angry character in a TV show. You'd be very good at that. <laughs> but I can't imagine you actually being angry. I, But I, I, I can be. But I think I don't, I, I would, well, I never have so far like reacted like Josh did. But because as it, like I'm on the other end of the spectrum, I feel I'm, like you would automatically turn it into a very funny. Oh God, no, mm-hmm. no. Okay, no. Th- I'm glad you think that, but you've just now ruined the illusion for everyone. <laughs> 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 well, I've ruined the illusion for everyone. <laughs> but like as an example, last night I was hanging clothes on the clothes horse. What? <laughs> it's just the things that we get angry about. The setup to them is always quite oh, yeah. innocuous <laughs> and funny. Yeah, yeah. exactly. But but uh, the the, the the reason I'm telling this is because I actually didn't get angry and it was a very unusual thing. I think because I've been listening to a lot of Rick Rubin, so I'm like in this zen <laughs> yeah. space. But I was hanging clothes on the on the clothes horse and then I, for whatever reason it was like full of clothes and I was like, oh, I might move this outside because <laughs> <laughs> it'll dry it quicker. Back underneath. Yeah. So then like it like folded under and I was like, oh, shit, <laughs> and then tried to like lift it up and then it snapped, like the thing snapped. And usually I'd be just, I'd be like, fucking hell. I'd get like frustrated, See, I can't picture that. annoyed with myself. And then I'd probably carry it around for like the next hour and then jam cops it. Or you know, not, not actually, but she just has to live with like Put a up with your grumpy lumber. person. Yeah. yeah. Mm. Um, but for whatever reason, I just was like, oh, well, I mean, of course, it's just clothes. It's not like a baby teething. It's the results of the clothes don't matter. Better baby keeping up or not is, yeah. is, is, a, is a bigger. But the point of my story was that it, I'd got the medicine out. So I didn't, it wasn't going to affect him. Oh, right. I was just angry mm-hmm. at myself for dropping the bottle. That was the mistake. It was the mistake. And, yeah. Because yeah, yeah. in the reality of it, I already had the medicine he needed out of the bottle in the syringe. So, right. and it was like 4 a.m. Medicine lasts for four hours. It was going to get, or 3 a.m. It's going to get us to through to the, the yeah. So it yeah. wasn't going to affect the outcome at all. It was just the mistake. Because, yeah, it was the mistake. I don't, maybe it's because I also made another mistake earlier that day that really affected Soph. So oh, I was yeah. like, I don't know if that could have compounded. So I was up, like yeah. mm-hmm. down on myself already for making a really stupid mistake earlier that day that really did affect her day. Uh, and then that, then I, here's another mistake. Mm. And the, it's like a, we talk, I know we've talked a lot about the negative self-talk and it can be a slow spiral, but it's like a real quick, it's <laughs> just like mm. a whirlpool, a whirlpool <laughs> yeah. that you get sucked into. And, and that's particularly the case for anger. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. sorry, I should let you talk actually because I've <laughs> gone on for long enough. No, no <laughs> I got think this that's M really <laughs> <laughs> no, that's really relevant. So the clothes horse. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, I'm sorry. So if we kind of look at the function of anger, first of all, um, and and the kind of origins of the rules around it, the function of anger primarily is to mobilise us into action. So. You know, in this, like this is representing the fight or flight response. This is the fight response, and that if we don't have that as a as a tool, then we are potentially unsafe. Mm-hmm. And like the th- the example that springs to mind about mobilising us into action is I don't know if if anyone out there with kids has had this experience where their child has done something really dangerous, and you've reacted to them with like with anger, mm. like very quickly, like mm. he, like how could you do that? Um. Or like, watch out for the road or whatever it might be. That's the exact example. I saw a lady the other day, her child nearly went on the road and she got so angry. And Uh I remember watching thinking, I get it, but isn't that funny that like that comes from a place of like so much love, but the child would see that as the complete opposite, just like so angry. So Yeah. yeah. That response represents this threat to something that's held sacred to us internally. Mm. Um, Chris Germer, who's a big self-compassion therapist and um, an author, speaks quite explicitly about the fact that anger really is information and it's information about what is being threatened 
and what is vulnerable in our lives. So the anger shows up in response to that child because here is the potential loss of my child showing up. Mm -hmm. The anger mobilised them to pull them back from the road Mm -hmm. and the anger is here, don't do that again. Mm. So as far as a reaction, so like Hugh's Hugh's example of like beeping the horn because someone cut Mm -hmm. him off or it was bad, like essentially road rage, um, is that because... You get we get angry or we get road rage because like the reckless driving of someone else or perceived reckless driving of someone else threatens our safety and the safety of the people in our car. So it's like, how dare you? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah it can be in general. Um, a road rage is a really interesting example because, yes, absolutely, what sits underneath the anger is a threat to my life potentially Mm. but also sometimes what sits under anger um, may be threats to my values and often things around fairness Mm. Um, or following rules Yeah. yeah yeah so for some people if there's a violation of a rule or a violation of what i believe is just or fair very quickly triggers it Mm -hmm. Mm. So I think, like, I guess what I'm saying is it's really important for us to, you know, slow it down in some ways to really recognise that anger is a very normal and very adaptive response for us in a lot of circumstances. Um, For us to understand what our anger signatures are is also important, and I'll get to that in a second. Anger signatures. That sounds interesting. But when we come back to kind of early childhood and the messages that we learn around anger, um, as children, we can experience both implicit rules around anger and explicit rules. Now, an implicit rule might be that anger is bad and the implicit experience is that no one ever expresses it. Mm. So by no one expressing anger or showing anger, being angry, the rules, like the messages that we kind of internalise are that it's not safe to express or feel anger. So mm-hmm. that then kind of mm-hmm. tends to move us into that that people pleasing end. So like suppression. that suppression end. Yeah. yeah. So mm-hmm. it, it must be must be not okay mm-hmm. to have this feeling. Yeah. And then on the other end of the spectrum, what we might witness are parents getting angry or being you know very reactive. And sometimes the message can come out there that anger gets us what we want quickly. Mm-hmm. So that that then becomes a, like almost like a mode of relating in the world is that anger prompts action and anger can get me what I need or anger can keep me safe from vulnerability, mm-hmm. really importantly. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that yeah. just makes me think of like the workplace. feels like an obvious example of that with like uh, people, bosses um, yelling at their employees because they want something done. And they and they feel like the best way to get that person to do that thing quickly and efficiently is to put the fear of God mm. into them. Mm. Sort of how we run the podcast, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking of Bridge, yeah, when you were saying that. <laughs> Classic <laughs> Bridge. <laughs> it's getting a bit awkward, but yeah. Yeah. <laughs> So as as kids, when we start to obviously soak up all these messages, we're then learning how to be with these feelings. Mm. Um, and we've got, so again, like those two opposite ends of the spectrum. So as adults, when these feelings show up, they're, they're, our responses are really very automatic. Mm. If we go through kind of the four components, um, so obviously there's this intense feeling of anger that might show up. Um and this is at the overreaction end of the spectrum. So we've then got our physiological response, big activation of the fight or flight response. Um, one aspect re- really interesting about the fight or flight response is that it narrows cognition. So we become very in tune with the current threat or the current concern. And this then affects how you're thinking and it affects our capacity for perspective taking. So I don't know if you've ever had this experience where maybe people around you are getting really angry about something and they cannot stop talking about it. Mm. Is that something? Yeah. That, yeah. Yeah. Mm. yeah. Keep bringing it up sort of thing. Yeah. And yeah. so the way we look at cognitions there is, or like your thinking, is that the, the thinking becomes ruminative, yep. mm. um, repetitive, and usually, um, again, it's very difficult to take in other information. And I could even ask you like right now, if you ever feel angry – there's probably like a top five thoughts that come up for you qu- quite commonly. Yeah. And these tend to often represent 
like values and core beliefs as well. Mm. So things like, why does this always happen to me? No one else can do this right. Um, I'm being disrespected. Yeah. And yep. they tend to, like, they tend to recur every time. So regardless of the context of the situation, these are like our kind of automatic mm. um, cognitions that show up. Mm. Which is really interesting and a really good place to actually put some strategies in. And the that I feel like when you talk about that repetitive thinking, to me that feels like passive aggression. Or it can mm-hmm. be like passive aggression where you kind of something happens, it triggers anger in you, but you suppress it, and then you just carry it with you, and you maybe make very passive aggressive comments to kind of signal to the person that they've done something without actually confronting them, and then it just like completely affects the day or the week or whatever. Yep. Yeah. Like and that, that then leads, like, that's a great point, and that leads into that last kind of component of the experience of anger, which is the actions. Mm. And that's that's where we can break it down into three things. The first is, or like under a category, would be aggression or hostility. Um, and that's obviously where we have like a physical exertion of of anger. And that doesn't have to be directed to other people. It can be very much directed to yourself. Or a door. Yes. Mm. Yeah. Yep, exactly. So there's like a physical exertion or physical sign of this feeling showing up. Um, and it can also obviously be verbal um, verbal aggression as well. Um, mm-hmm. And then the next part on the spectrum is um, passive aggression, exactly what you've mentioned, Ryan. Mm-hmm. And that is that this feeling, like there's like it's an attempt to control this feeling mm. by not bursting out with it, mm. but it's a message nonetheless to express yeah, okay. mm. this feeling. So giving the cold shoulder, being distant, yeah, yeah. withdrawing, sulking, um, eye Not rolling. messaging back. Yeah. Yep, all that sort of stuff. Mm. And then the last one is is being passive. And so that's actually like a non, almost like a non-reaction. It's completely all. disengaging. From, yeah, yeah, yeah. And what's really interesting in the research is that I don't put the fear of God in listeners about this, that there's some really um, difficult health outcomes for suppression. So whilst we idealise in some ways not being overtly aggressive, that there's this taboo about expressing anger, there are actually some genuine health consequences for a chronic suppression of, of anger. Bring it on. This is good. Great. <laughs> Um, so I think that really we like we really have to investigate. Well, what you know, what's going on here that mm. I'm not able to either feel that anger, or I'm not able to assert myself or stay with this feeling in a really wise way without moving into either end. Mm. So maybe I'm assuming you're getting to this, but what are the health implications mm-hmm. like for for? Someone who hypothetically suppresses their anger. Yeah. <laughs> um, what what is yeah. the impl- what are the implications? They're kind of like the top the top things. So heart attack, stroke, cancer. Because really? you're bottling it up. Yeah, and like I don't have I don't have the research mm-hmm. um, off the top of my head, but there is a, a a big body of research around the correlation between suppression of anger and health outcomes, and I think that says a great deal about the experience of stress in the body. That is mm. so fascinating because often like if people want to identify themselves as like the nice guy mm. or girl, you know, the mm-hmm. nice person, um, part of that could be suppressing anger so you never come across as being angry. I think that's definitely a part of how I want to present to the world, which is why Hugh, you can't imagine me being angry mm. because it's so important to me that you think I'm a nice guy. <laughs> mm. um, and you, Josh, like anyone, anyone that I meet, like it's important. Like I want people to... Th- walk away from an interaction with me thinking, he is such a nice guy. What a lovely guy. And so part of that is I can never, um, I don't know, never thought about it consciously, but I can't express anger because then my fear is that like I'll, people will think, gee, he's a, mm. he's a live one. Like, you know, you've got to be mm. careful around him. He's, he's, he's tough to be around mm. and that's the fear. But that is so fascinating. Okay, so if I can't suppress... Mm-hmm. <laughs> What? what yeah. So what's uh, the, yeah. It's, it's, I guess the battle's like how do you find a middle ground? Yeah. And well, on that, it just made me re- just made me think about a conversation I had with Penny where she'd been chatting to her psychologist just on the topic of anger, nothing to do with anything she was going through, but it just came up. And her psychologist said the way that, the, the, like how angry people get 
we'll use road rage for an example. If you go and yell and scream at someone, the message is there just, and I don't respect you. I have no respect for you. But on the other side, if you're completely passive and you let someone dominate you, you're saying you have no respect for yourself. And so it's about being assertive without um, having too much of an impact on another person. That's like the having respect for that person and having your respect for yourself is like that's where you need to be. But so often the passive one is I don't have respect for myself. This is if you're wronged or something goes, yeah. if you know what I mean, yeah. Mm. I think spot on, yeah, absolutely. And I think – Was that relevant at all or did yeah. I just say something I know? <laughs> no, well, I mean that that is <laughs> – I know something. Can I say? It's a good new format for the podcast. Something we know. <laughs> and it has to be in the middle of one of M sentences. <laughs> so I think that really highlights um, that, first of all, it highlights how important it is for us to be aware of our of the signatures of anger um, to be able to actually make wise choices yeah. around, you know, because if we're, I know this sounds so cliched, but I can't express it enough. If we're not aware of what is happening, we cannot possibly make healthy, wise, assertive choices. It's just, it is really not possible. Aware of what is happening within us. Yeah. Can, can we yeah. use Josh's example from last night? Mm -hmm. Like when in that situation does he stop and say, I'm feeling really angry? Well, before we go on to that, can I, I think it's interesting that I made a disclaimer saying like I've never been angry at anyone else. Like as if I was quite proud of that, but now the more you've spoken, I think that's part of the issue in that I feel it and then I suppress it because I never want to be angry at other mm. people. Yes, mm. yeah, yeah. And I don't think I've ever – maybe during sport, yes, during like a sporting contest, yes, but not in – out off the field. I was a bit – not ironically, probably part of the thing was that I probably got a bit of white line fever when I played sport. But I was going to say that plays into that more. I reckon you're angry at other things that – maybe that were happening and then you took it out on your poor opponent. <laughs> yeah. Which yeah. would have been like in some ways deemed as appropriate. Well, it was part of the rules. Of football. Of, yeah. I was like, I wasn't very skilled, but I, I was quite good at sort of tackling and bumping mm. people. So it was like my role on the team was to kind of hurt people. This is when I was a teenager. But, and it was so counter to my personality of off the field because it's like, mm. it felt like I, it was allowed there and it was a way of doing it. But um, I just think it's interesting that I was sort of, which is, it is true, but I thought that was all good. But now it's like, actually, that's probably because I seem to be the suppression and then self, not self-loathing, <laughs> anger. Yeah. So I don't, I don't mean to, um, I, I certainly don't mean to make people feel uncomfortable about, you know, the, the consequences of our experiences with anger. But mm. I think that's also really true is that you can oscillate between the two. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. So we can oscillate between, and this is like the pressure cooker analogy, right? So, you know, and like that slow level or the slow leak is like, you know, over a period of time I can contain this. And that's like an effort to control this discomfort that's here. And so you suppress it and you hold it down and then it, it shows up so quickly that it feels almost like unconscious. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, like the space between the bottle dropping mm. and your reactivity would have been... Well, it felt like milliseconds. Yeah. Like I yeah. couldn't tell you. I, yeah, it mm -hmm. felt like... Yeah. Now, I don't know what the time would have been, but it must have been less than two seconds. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I don't really know how to get in at that point and stop. Yeah. So yeah. I, maybe this kind of moves us into, you know, how... What do we do? Mm. Um, yeah. But I just... Just before we get there, I'm just there's just another thought that's come to my mind and I... One of the things I wanted to express is that so often if we can stay with the feeling of anger in a um, supportive way, in a compassionate way and in an accepting way, we often come to like really much more vulnerable feelings underneath that. And so you may have heard of like the analogy of, of anger is like the iceberg, so we only see the tip. Mm -hmm. And then underneath, you know, uh, like the anger is there protecting us from exposure to these other really uncomfortable, mm. maybe more painful feelings. Mm. I mean, this happens, you know, this happens so often, like in my office where, you know, if we, can st if we can stay with that feeling in this moment right now, it will often give way to grief or... What's really happening. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And so the anger is giving us information. But if we're not kind of wise to it and if we're not you know, holding this with a kind of like a gentle awareness, then we don't ever get to understand 
this pattern of reactivity and what this actually is signaling, I guess. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Um, this is just a very simple example. My son, this always happens in the car, my son was in the back seat and he was really like angry about something and I actually just said to him, and this is like the rare moments where being a psychologist is helpful, and I said to him, <laughs> Marty, it sounds like you feel really angry. And he's like, I am. I am really angry. And then two seconds later, he just burst into tears. And then it was like, oh, that was where the feeling was. The feeling was he felt he felt really let down. Mm. And I just thought that was really like such yep. an interesting example to me about how if we can stay with the feeling, mm. there's always something. There's It's protecting something. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Whether it's protecting you from feeling pain or it's protecting like something that's sacred to you. I think yeah, I think embarrassment's a big one as well. Like people would rather look angry than embarrassed. Like if you see someone stub their toe in public, they're like, fuck's sake and like <laughs> walk around like like so angry. But they're really just embarrassed. So like I don't look yeah. very well delivered. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. People trip over or whatever and they hurt themselves and they just get angry at yeah. at, the, at, the, yeah. at the park bench seat that was always gonna be there and like Yeah, dear council. Yeah. The fuck is that doing there? Yeah. Fuck's sake. Who would put a little step next to a park bench. I mean, seriously. I was humiliated in front of my children. Yeah, the letter goes on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think that's a maybe example of like what the, the actual emotion is embarrassment, mm -hmm. but you don't want that. So yeah. anger looks cooler or something. I don't know. Yeah, well, it More actually- acceptable for a man to, to be angry and embarrassed. Yeah, and, and also the anger feeling can make you feel more in control. And oh, as yeah. humans, we, we dislike- Mm. feeling out of control, ambiguity and uncertainty. But anger is such a such an active, mobilised feeling that it makes you feel like I can control this situation. Mm -hmm. So, and that's the same way, like, gosh, I remember even when, you know, when you're in your, like, teenage years or in your 20s and you're dating people and you just feel really annoyed or really upset that, like, the dating situation hasn't worked out. And it's so much easier for you to stay angry at that person rather than to actually mm. sit in the feelings of sadness or the feelings mm. of loss than actually stay angry. Mm. Yeah. I just find that really fascinating. And you That's often so hear people say, um, I've heard it a lot when, like, a relationship's kind of fizzled out. People say it'd be so much easier if they'd done something wrong so I could be angry. Mm. Mm. Oh, yeah. Is a common phrase I've yeah. heard. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's interesting. Mm -hmm. What's I remember hearing, I forget where I read or heard this, but it's like the idea of a, a triangular column, just to visualise a triangular column. And I think it's like a thing used in therapy where on one of the three sides it says, poor me, and on the second side it says, that bad person, and then on the third side it says something which I can never remember, but it's the third <laughs> sounds side. Sounds like the really important side. <laughs> it's a really important one. But often we are looking at the two sides of either poor me or that bad person. Mm. And, and that's often where we kind of, I don't know if this is relevant to anger necessarily, but I think about that a lot, even though I can't remember what the third side is. <laughs> <laughs> but but I, I, I see it in myself and I see it in other people all the time, which is like something has happened, which is maybe out of my control. And I either go to that kind of unfair reaction, which is like, oh, poor, you know, this, of course this is happening to me today. Like, you know, I'm just, um, blah, blah, blah. Or you find someone else or something else to, to blame, whether it be like the person who put the step at the park and you stubbed your toe. It's like, oh, who would put that there? Is it, I'm, I was sort of hoping that you'd be like, oh, yeah, that's the Johnson technique or something. <laughs> <laughs> for, actually, for a second, I was trying to visualise a circular cone. I was really struggling to oh. actually visualise it, but now I have it in my head. Triangular. Yes. yes. Like a pyramid. Yeah. Yes. That's really interesting, those two sides of the column because they kind of represent also different states of your nervous system functioning. Mm. So in the state of fight or flight, it's usually blame. Yep. Then when we're shifting more down into possibly um, numbness and suppression, it shifts into why me? Mm -hmm. So it becomes more of a um, almost like a dissociated response mm. or a dis like detaching response. Mm -hmm. Are you picturing the wombat? <laughs> Don't bring um, up the wombat. Okay, sorry. Bridge, have you found it? Oh, that's it. Okay. Yeah, the third side is what should I do from now on? Oh, that's good. Yeah. And that and that like the it must it probably was in like the courage to be disliked or one of those types of books. And yeah, it's like the thank you, Bridge. It's like the what should I do from now on, poor me and that bad person. 
and often we're looking at the side where we can see the two sides of the thing, which is poor me or that bad person, where we should spin it around and say, what should I do from now on? Mm. Yeah. And that's in some ways, if we zoom out, that's actually cognitive flexibility or perspective mm-hmm. taking. Mm. So when it comes to doing work around anger, there isn't like I can't give you one strategy today that is going to change your experience or relationship with anger. This is genuinely something that we need to spend some time reflecting and working with. Mm. Um, there are kind of you know places to start with this. Um, and like I said before, I cannot express how important awareness is. And it might just be at the beginning, like taking a moment to to think about, okay, so what are my triggers? Mm. So just writing down what are the triggers for me? And it may be um, that the triggers are around, like, you know, Josh, in your experience, it may be like perfectionistic yep, um, triggers, a making a mistake. Yep. 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 Um, there may be other triggers like social justice issues. There could be like a violation of um, moral codes or things like that. So having an understanding of what your triggers are is really vital. Mm. As a starting point, I think that us being able to practice more mindful awareness becomes really important. Mm -hmm. And I don't mean, when I say mindful awareness, again, this is just one approach. It's my kind of Mm. my perspective on this. But when we're not in tune with our, like the early warning signs of anger rising, there is no capacity for us to stop it or to move into suppression. So for both suppression and overreactivity, if we can't pay attention to the early warning signs of anger rising, then it becomes very difficult for us to do something differently. To sort of turn the boat around, essentially. Yeah. Once you're in the thick of the anger. Yeah. Yeah, okay. So I hate to use your example so constantly, Josh, but like you mentioned that earlier in the day you'd made a mistake. Yeah, yeah. And so there will have been a stress response happen for that. Yeah, there was. And then there's probably, I mean, I don't mean to be analysing this much, but there's probably a carrying of stress throughout the day. Yeah, yeah, and Um, shame. And in that case, I'd made a mistake that affected Soph and the night before we'd run out of that Panadol. Mm -hmm. So Soph went and bought some more Panadol that day. So I had, in my mind, pretty quickly I'd let her down now Mm -hmm. twice. Yeah. Yeah. In in a pretty short yeah. period of time, yeah. yeah. So that experience of um, of stress, discomfort, um, shame was really kind of building throughout the day, mm. which then leads you like the more it's building, the more it leads you to reactivity. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So mm. this is where something like the practice of mindfulness becomes really relevant, not just in the moment of practicing meditation, but how that meditation generalizes across your day. And look, I realize very readily that mindfulness meditation is not for everyone. And so, you know, please take it or leave it. But the kind of traditional practice of mindfulness is not about calmness. And I really want to be clear about that. It's about moment to moment awareness with an attitude of non judgment, presence. Yeah. yeah. And connection. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, and so one practice that I use, you know, quite often, both for myself and also with my clients is you know, a, a brief meditation practice, which is very much just about an in, like almost like an internal weather check. So, I mean, technically speaking, it's called a three-minute breathing space and it's in those three minutes that we're starting to recognise what are the thoughts that are showing up in this moment right now? So what are the thoughts that are passing through my mind? What sensations are showing up in my body? And I think that's a really key one with anger in particular because it is so physical. Mm. And then what's the feeling tone? So it's like in this moment right now, is there a sense of um, ease in the body? Is there a sense of pleasantness or unpleasantness? Um, is there agitation? So this is kind of giving you a window. And then after that kind of check-in, we then can focus on the breath for a minute as a centering and anchoring kind of mm-hmm. strategy. And then the last minute of that three-minute breathing space is expanding our awareness to this current moment right now. Yeah. So this is like just one way. And there are lots of other kind of grounding strategies, but it's doing more than grounding. It's actually checking in with what is my experience like right now? And it gives us a circuit breaker. Mm. So it, it gives us this capacity to be able to choose more readily, like how we want to be responding. I, um, I, did, I didn't know if I was going to mention this, but I think I will now. Um, at last week, and I was going to thank you off, Mike, but I'll thank you while they're on. Um, I was getting, I was noticing all these, the sig- signals of anger and I was getting shorter and shorter with, it was just been a long couple of days with the kids and I was get, starting to get really angry at everything and things were annoying me. And I just like, I went out the back 
and I sat in a chair and I did that thing that you told us to do about five things you can, mm-hmm. and I did it about, I had to do it about 10 times <laughs> over and over and over. So five things you can see, five things you, you can hear, yeah, as you can five smell. And feel. Yeah. So all the senses basically. Mm. Um, and yeah, I did it about, because I was like, I knew that my anger was unjustified and it was not helpful to the day. And we had a really good day ahead. And I went and went outside and um, yeah, and sat there and did it, and spent about five minutes out there. And I was, it was remarkable. It turned my whole day around. Like I, oh, wow. I was able to go back inside and be the person that I wanted Gosh. to be, rather than this person who was on a bit of a runaway train of about to get angry about something or or, or just just acting, just not the person I wanted to be. And it was, so thank you. <laughs> oh, I just got some yeah. chills. Thank you. That's really, I'm yeah. so, um, I'm so pleased to hear that. Mm, it was incredible. But, so. but there's something in there though that, that feels important is that there was a choice that you made to do it. Yeah. So there yeah. was a space that you, that you found yeah. just to go like, okay, I need to do this right now. Yeah. yeah. And that, like that actually feels almost more important than the actual strategy that you implemented. Does that make the, sense? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That you were, I was able to find the mm. space. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, I literally, yeah, yeah. It, was, it just ran out the door. Mm. <laughs> but that's like extreme <laughs> yeah. awareness, isn't it? Like in, yeah. the, in the thick of it. Because, yeah, yeah, it's like I'm, we all know what it feels like to be in the, in the midst of like anger or frustration and like you just think like, oh, nothing's going to help. Just mm. don't, you know, you just, but to actually pull yourself out of it and, and do that is it, like, I've got to say it felt so good afterwards. It was like, because sometimes I think it's, I think we've spoken about this in other episodes, but there's something... For me anyway, when you are starting to get a bit down or angry, there's something a bit seductive about it and you kind of want to go down that path mm. in a bit because you want to mm. express this frustration. and It's very compelling. Yeah. Um, and so to say no to it is kind of like feels like you're saying no to the sugar sort of thing. And then, But then the feeling of taking control of that moment was so good. It felt amazing. And, I, and I've only really, it's very rare that I've been able to do that. In mm-hmm. fact, that might be the first time. Well, that's it was on kind Sunday. of like, I can't think of it. it was it wasn't that long ago. It was on Sunday. I think like most people would probably go with the poor me or that bad person on that the three sided. Well, I think I most uh, and most of the time I do. Yeah. This is a rare, rare, rare chance that I. But like do. that is what should I do from now on? Which is like I'm mm-hmm. gonna go outside and do that thing that Emily told me. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And if you are, I think the point you're making before, like some people might struggle to just be able to do that from a standing start. You know, all of a sudden mm-hmm. we start doing this scheduling time in your day where you maybe. So I've all become, I've all of a sudden become obsessed with my sleep and wanting data on my sleep. So I got an aura ring, which some people might know aura rings, um, and I have been wearing that. And it gives, and there's, it links to an app on my phone. And it gives you all this stuff about when you should go to bed and like, and it gives you little tips and points. Like I'm doing that for them now. Um, <laughs> uh, but one of the things it offers up a meditation just before you go to bed, mm. and every night it's a different one. But one of them was a reflection on your, I can't remember what it's called, but it was like a reflection on your day and it was all about letting go of the bad stuff that happened throughout the day, like thinking about it, how it made you feel, what came up in your body for you and now letting it go because it's not happening right now and it's not, you know, you're in bed and you're safe, all that kind of stuff. And that with the second I did, I went, oh, this feels like such a good pressure release. Like, And so that now I actually go back in and do that one every single night before I get to bed. It's five minutes and that's probably helped me a lot, I think. I haven't thought about it till now, but because every night I get this pressure releases in all the stuff that annoyed me in the day, little things. I think about them, then I make a conscious effort to let them go. That might be a nice thing for people to do as well, not not get an aura ring. But it's, um, I think, putting time aside where you, some kind of mindful, mindfulness practice where you get that release of letting go of all the things that are making you feel angry. Yeah, I think that's absolutely, absolutely spot on. Um, and like any kind of practice where we can slow things down, I think is really useful. Um, mm. You know, at its at its basic level, and again, this is overused, but this capacity for us to take a breath because it it, it you know if we're really paying attention to it, it actually can move us in from out from that stress response into more of the calm, connected, engaged um, nervous system response, and it gives us a little moment to pause. Mm. So you know, this is really relevant too in terms of parenting. Like I can't control my children's behavior but I control how I'm responding to this experience right now and that might very well be gosh taking lots of breaths but like Mm. just pausing enough to take this breath before I tell you something else or before I respond to you when you do um 
sleep training. They make sure before you go, for when you've got a child, and we, uh, sleep school is what they call it. And um, one of the key things before you go in to do the settling is you have to stand outside and take like three really deep breaths mm. before entering the room. And it's so powerful <laughs> and useful. That's so important. And it's so yeah. interesting, just three, like the, just three breaths yeah. is really grounding and settling. Yeah. 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 It's, um, yeah. I need to use that in other. Mm-hmm. In, <laughs> I mean, that is the thing that makes me most angry. The sleep thing. Just yeah. l- losing sleep, getting mm-hmm. woken up constantly by kids. That mm-hmm. is the thing where I feel most angry in my life, definitely. Mm-hmm. So it's probably much more beneficial for my relationship with my kids if I take three breaths before I go in to ask them <laughs> yeah. why they're struggling to sleep. It's so powerful, just that. And it's it sounds so simple, but yeah, it's, mm-hmm. yeah, I mean, you know everything about it, but from my lived experience, just like taking and taking a breath that's like, I find I do it like unusually big. Like the biggest, deepest mm. breath I can possibly mm. do feels like it really changes. If I just do three normal size breaths, no, it doesn't seem to work as well for me as yeah. like feeling massive my lungs breaths. massive breaths, uh, yeah. big ones, and almost like a challenge of can I make them as big as I can three times? And that mm. really helps. Yeah. yeah. For me personally, anyway. So that, you know, absolutely, this kind of mindful awareness or present moment focus giving us enough space to pause. And then, kind of in addition to that, there's also kind of having a look at your thoughts and this particular strategy that 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 I tend to use I've mentioned in other other episodes before it's around cognitive diffusion and if you think about um, when unhelpful or um, unpleasant thoughts are showing up it sometimes feels like we're fused with them so like we mm. believe the total truth of these thoughts that are here they also represent like exactly who I am or what this current experience is and so this is the idea that we're really kind of welded to these thoughts. Mm-hmm. When mm-hmm. we're practicing something like cognitive diffusion, it is really around like unwelding. So giving us like a space between us and the thought. Mm-hmm. So when it comes to something like anger, particularly if it's more prone towards the reactivity end, it can be something as simple as I'm noticing anger rising or even just saying like anger rising or here is anger that can be just another like short circuit way of diffusing from the the tyranny of those ruminations. So sort of naming that it's something you're experiencing rather than that I am angry. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. I'm I'm noticing here is anger or and even if it, like in the space of conflict or even with our kids like I'm noticing I'm feeling really angry. Um, or we can like even move into being playful around that. Like in previous episodes kind of talked about having like a character. So we can have like our angry character that shows up today, like even saying like, oh, hello, Gertrude's here today. Um, um, or <laughs> here's, that's always my go-to. It's Gertrude, really weird. Is your ang- Gertrude your angry character? No, it's always like my character name. I don't know why. Uh-huh. Um, it actually <laughs> makes me think of a funny story at the Bourne Cinema, but that's... Oh, oh, oh. Here we go. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Wonderful. Finally. <laughs> Funny. Here we go. Just trigger warning for everyone. No. Another ball in the cinema story. It's not funny enough. <laughs> it oh, it, it, it actually doesn't matter. It worked for me. <laughs> Has it stopped me in the past? The great thing with ball in cinema stories <laughs> is it can be about anything. <laughs> <laughs> and it always makes the edit. <laughs> can you tell me what it is? Just even for kind of... I just think there was a period of time where we used to have different names when we'd answer the phone. Oh, yes. And Gertrude right. was definitely mine. Mine was Henson. <laughs> Henson? Yeah, it just made up a name. So what's the example? How would you answer the phone? Um, what was the, um, uh, hi, this is the ball on cinema. This is Henson speaking. Oh, hi Henson. Yeah. I was just wondering what time, uh, Armageddon's on tonight. <laughs> uh, this is 6.15 and 9.30. Thank you so much, Henson. What, where does that name come from? <laughs> it's, a good, it's a good, my mother Gertrude called me that. Oh, <laughs> beautiful. Do you know what it means, Henson? It means my mum all of a sudden. <laughs> <laughs> it means well-meaning. Does it? Yeah. <laughs> I'll look well that mean. up. <laughs> it means Don't. well mean. <laughs> Don't look it up. Thanks oh. for calling, though. That's all right. I'll see you at 6.15, Henson. Get there at 6. <laughs> all right, that. <laughs> Necessary tangent. I hope that doesn't go in. Um, <laughs> yes, so giving your anger a character, like mm-hmm. really being able to kind of um, physicalise, like not only physicalise but also kind of give it this kind of sense of being like in some way distanced from you. So mm. being able to name like, you know, you know, here she is, she, I can I can feel her right now, she's really in the room and she's wanting to push me around in this moment. I can see you, 
I can mm. see that you're here. And then we can use kind of grounding, so like feeling my feet on the ground, checking in with your senses, taking those breaths. So again, giving you this kind of space to relate and also expand that um, that perspective taking. Mm-hmm. So that I, I remember you saying in a previous episode, it's good to give a character to different emotions that pop up. And for some reason, I thought you literally meant choose a character from. So I chose Phil Dumphy from Modern Family, and so he's a he's a really great one, like mm. because it does give you that distance. So both the examples that Josh and Ryan gave of what caused anger for them last night, hearing them from a distance, they're funny, like they cause them both to feel really angry, but like. A, a, a clothesline collapsing underneath you is very funny to watch. Yes, it would have looked hilarious. And yeah. spilling like medicine is like a bottle of medicine. That's quite mm. funny to, to hear about. It. I understand why it made you both angry, but I think it has the same effect when you, if something happens, if you think of Phil Dunphy, whatever you're thinking, for me, Phil Dunphy explaining what's happening to me in his like very earnest, loving, and comical way, that gives me a bit of distance from mm-hmm. it. Mm-hmm. But I think that's the effect yeah. that you're kind of after. Yeah. And the thing is that, again, with this is we're not moving into suppression. So we're really actually naming and allowing this feeling to be here, not trying to minimise it or get rid of it, um, but really naming like here is anger and it, it's, you know, like feel it in my body. You know, I can ha- I can notice urges to be physical. So we can really name all of this, but mm-hmm. it takes a lot of practice to be able to be kind of this kind of mindfully aware of that experience, mm-hmm. I guess. A writer that I really like, um, he, I heard him speak once about how I think someone was asking him why he's angry because uh, uh, Christopher Hitchens is his name and he, his response was, I, well, I, uh, and it was implied like it was a bad thing and his response was I think we need to question why it's such a bad thing. Anger f- for him, he was saying, can be an incredibly motivating and narrowing and inspirational emotion. And I always found that because it's so foreign to me that that was a possibility. But it, I like some of the sort of reframing that is implied of what we've talked about, that you can get it to a point potentially. I don't know if this is true and maybe you could say whether you agree or not, but that you can get it to a point where anger is a helpful emotion as opposed to something that's a burden or something that's a problem yeah. for you. A hundred percent. And even if you think about this in terms of like social justice movements, we don't Mm. have them. And I think Brene Brown talks about this. We don't have social justice movements without anger. Mm. Yeah. Mm. So they can be mobilised, you know, these feelings can be mobilised for the good. Yeah. um, Provided we can act with them wisely, really. Yeah. Yeah. In control. Yeah. 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 Um, So, and that's a really key point too, is that we can't control the feeling, but we can control our actions around it. Mm. Or bring awareness certainly to the actions mm. around it. Yeah. yeah, good point. Yeah. That's really good. The, like the resilience project curriculum would not exist if it wasn't for anger. Mm, really? That's a curriculum that goes to like nearly half a million kids around Australia at the moment. Because when I first did it, it was okay, but it was our first go at it six years ago. And I went to a conference, and there was a school who does a lot of stuff, and they had managed to get our curriculum, and they were going through it with a fine tooth comb, trying to find out what they didn't like about it. And then one of their guest speakers spoke about what's not good about it pretty much in a public forum. And I was so angry. And I was like, oh, you are going to regret doing that. I'm going to make this so fucking good. And that that was honestly my motivation. To, it went from like providing this curriculum for kids because I need it. Into, to, into an act of spite. Yeah, seriously. And then we, <laughs> like, we literally invested. And once I, once I got over it, it was like back to we're doing this because this is a really good thing to offer up. But <laughs> a lot of the motivation was like, oh, you're yeah. going to wish you didn't do that. Because this is going to be so good now. We might cut this out. I'm not sure, but um, <laughs> but that was honestly for a while. That really, yeah, really, really got me going. And mm. it's interesting because that could have also gone gone the other way. It could have gone into avoidance. So, right. like, you know, that feeling could have prompted you to withdraw, for example, mm. um, or to not like not push you to do more. I would have withdrawn. Yeah, yeah. I think I might have withdrawn my, as well. Yeah, my mm. response would have been to withdraw. Mm. Yeah, had a. Someone say at the AFL, yeah, your stuff's a bit of a fad in AFL clubs when I'd just done two or three clubs. And it was quite a hurtful thing to say. Yeah, it's mm-hmm. a bit of a fad. People will get over it. They'll move on to the next thing pretty soon. And I was really hurt, then very angry. And I thought, well, I'm going to make sure this is in every club pretty soon. And I'd like, we went to every single club and still do stuff in clubs. And I, it was a lot of that was driven by someone saying that what it was, it was like anger that drove mm-hmm. it. I was like, okay, I take that on board and it hurts and I'm angry about it. And now I'm going to prove you wrong. So maybe I'm driven purely by anger. Yeah, you are an angry person. <laughs> <laughs> Benji was very right. <laughs> wow. Again, we might cut that out, but that's um, – I was just thinking about that. I never thought about that, but mm. it's 
It's mm. it's um it can be it can be a good thing. Yeah. If mm. we use it in, as motivation to like well intentioned anger, I think Jerry mm. Seinfeld said that actually when he was doing he had a gig at um, that place that everyone wants to be the Comics Lounge in oh, I North can't Melbourne. No, <laughs> 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 whatever the one in yeah, LA, yeah, yeah, is, the, the comedy the, the, store or something. Yeah, not yeah. the Comics Lounge. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so Jerry Seinfeld had a gig at wherever it was you want to have a gig, the, the mm. comic store or whatever it was. The comedy or, store, I think it's called. Yeah, yeah, and the person who, he was really new his career and they said, no, nah, we're not interested in you doing this anymore. We've done a few and like, no, nah, you're not good enough. And he said- Mitzi, Mitzi Shaw. Yeah, that's it, mm-hmm. yeah. And he said in an interview- Holy Shaw's mum, weirdly. Really? Mm-hmm. There you go. I don't know who either those people are, but yeah. Nah, don't worry about it. I won't. <laughs> <laughs> cool. So, <laughs> so yeah. Um, and he said, he used that. He went away and go, well, I'm going to work- so much. He was. He said, I wasn't full-time on it. I was like, a couple of days a week. I went, I'm going to be full-time now and I'm going to show them mm. that I'm good enough for this. And he said, sometimes you'd be, sometimes in life, you've got to take this stuff on board, let it hurt you, let it make you angry, angry, and then show people what you are capable of, use that as motivation. And and I just listened to it. I was like, gosh, I think I've done that quite a few times actually. Mm. And as a result, Jerry Seinfeld's photo is like one of the only comedians not up in the comedy store. Really? Yeah. Oh, that's right. Mm. Yes. Yeah, yeah that's right. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Anyway. <laughs> Another so, bit of anger. <laughs> so there's just a couple of other things I thought might be worthy of, of mentioning, and that is, you know, at some point, you know, in this process of kind of reflecting upon your own experiences of anger is also have a look at the kind of cost that it's having. Mm-hmm. So, you know, when you get really fused with feelings of anger, you know, how much attention does that take up or how much, importantly, how much energy does that take up for you? Mm. So if you think about like if all of this energy that is spent thinking about feeling, getting hooked and fused by this particular incident or person, imagine what you would be doing with all that anger if that wasn't showing up. Mm. So what could you be doing differently if you weren't so hooked into these feelings? I think this kind of really starts to kind of really highlight and really like what your, I just said really like a million times, um, what your values are and that so often when we get hooked by those feelings, they actually pull us away from that value direction. Um, mm-hmm. So you get like you get caught in rumination, um, the feelings in the body, and then before you know it, we might be using kind of um, strategies like numbing, like alcohol, TV, scrolling, social media um, yeah. to cope with the rumination that's showing up. Mm. So you end up acting in ways that are not aligned with your values yeah. as well. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah. So it's definitely not about getting rid of the feeling, paying attention to it, bringing um, awareness to it, bringing self-compassion to the shame that shows up when we feel the anger, definitely. And then looking at, okay, so how is it? Like that's like that third side really. How is it that I want to be? How do I want to show off my life now? Mm. How can I do things differently in the future? You know, how is it that I want to be in relationship in my relationships? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And the, the kind of last point to this, and I haven't really touched on this probably enough, is around the suppression end and, you know, how can we actually hold on to that feeling of anger? And that is really important because it slips off really quickly into into other things. Mm-hmm. So it'll slip off into sadness or anxiety or into num- in, we move into numbing. Mm-hmm. So having an, an awareness in the body because there will be a flicker of anger that shows up in the body. And so we kind of really need to be in tune with like like momentary um, elevated heart rate, for example, or a flushing of the cheeks or a clenching in the hands. So those are good signatures for us to pay attention to. Mm. And then it's going to be, become about you know, how do I practice assertiveness? And, you know, I've kind of mentioned this a little bit and assertiveness is, uh, you know, is a hard thing to, you know, really practice without, certainly without awareness. Um but kind of really kind of experimenting with moments where I can say, you know, I feel really angry. Mm. So being able just to, to speak up to someone and say, this, I feel really angry. So really owning the feelings. This is my feeling. It's not your feeling. You haven't made me angry. Yeah. The actions may have contributed to how I'm feeling. But using things like I statements. Are you guys familiar with I statements? No, yeah. Yep. So I statements are, you know, kind of fairly, and you can easily Google this as very kind of common assertiveness skills training. I statements are moving us away from accusatory language. So so often when we're angry, angry we move into uh, blaming, shaming, naming, labelling, mm-hmm. all that sort of stuff, which is very uh, you-driven. So you did this, you're wrong, you made me feel this. Um, and when we engage in that kind of communication, 
most often the response from the other person is defensiveness or shutdown. Mm-hmm. So it never kind of moves us towards like healthy interactions usually. So with an I statement, we really turn that round. And it, again, we have to slow down enough to notice how to do this. But it's I felt sad when you left the dishes on the sink. I'd really prefer if we could work about this in a different way mm-hmm. rather than you left the dishes on the sink, what's wrong with you? It makes me really mad. Mm-hmm. Very interesting. So it's the I feel we have to be aware of that first. I feel when this. Mm. Or we can reverse it and say, when you did this, I felt really disappointed. So it's, it's, a, it's letting the person know how it's made you feel so they know how their behaviour or accidentally probably has affected you. And so mm-hmm. is that like an empathy building thing where yeah, they can understand? That, yeah. yeah. Yep, absolutely. Mm. But it's also really acknowledging that it is appropriate for us to feel anger, like that it is a normal Mm. human response for us to feel angry about Mm. and in response to certain situations. Yep. Yep. So it's very like I really want to validate and normalise this experience is okay to have. It's how we respond to it that's really problematic usually. Yep. Okay, Mm. cool. Yep. So with the suppression and underreactivity, we actually want to move you up so we're a bit more active. Mm. With the overreactivity, we want to kind of move you down so you're like more balanced. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Amazing, Em. Yeah. So good. Yeah. Oh, well, you really should write a book. Yeah. You really should. You really yeah. should. That's very kind. I can save one. the best stuff for the podcast. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> stuff that doesn't make it. Yes. Definitely the you book. can call a book like second rate stuff. <laughs> <laughs> stuff that didn't make the podcast. <laughs> and then we can co author the Bourne Cinema History. Stories. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Maybe like a little, like a short story. <laughs> <laughs> Optional extra. <laughs> uh, well, Dr. M, thanks for coming in again. Good oh, to see you. Thanks so much for thanks, having me. It's been great to be here. Amazing. Again. Thank you. The Imperfects is hosted and produced by Hugh Van Kylenberg, Ryan Shelton, and Josh Van Kylenberg. Our executive producer is Bridget Northeast. This episode was filmed by Andy Poole and edited by Jamison Moore.